annual inspections, why do we do them and, and what are they? It's a great question. Everybody gets to do that, what, annually? Annually. Uh, an annual inspection is uh, mandated by the FAA and we're going to have to go through the process of inspecting the airplane. And we, we really are looking at multiple things in the annual inspection. And the first one is to make sure that the airplane still conforms with its type certificate. Yeah, because it didn't last year, right? Mm -hmm. So, so much changed that, yeah. Yeah. So it's working great. You want to take it apart so we can look to make sure it's working great. Is that it, what we're doing? It was a perfectly good airplane before we took it, it on. It right? would have been fine just leaving it alone. Yeah, yeah. But we can't change the regs, so we're going to take it apart. Yeah. There's something else we look at. You want to share with them what, uh, what we actually look for? Oh, we look for, yeah. So we're looking to see if it conforms, like it has the right engine and propeller. And then we look for, and this is the thing that's kind of subjective, is whether it's safe for flight. So, uh, you know, are the tires safe for flight? Uh, is the airframe safe for flight? Um, and some people's determination of safe for flight might be different than someone else's. Uh, but the FAA has the minimum scope and detail, which is in FAR 43 Appendix D, and it's kind of boring, but you'd be surprised what isn't in there, like servicing. Oil changes are not in uh, Appendix D. Um, there's just almost nothing in there, but that's what you can use for the annual inspection. On the other hand, you can use the Cirrus checklist. Yeah, which is like 25 pages. Yeah, big old and, long And thing. it's going to be very prescriptive, line by mm -hmm. line. Change the oil, cut open the oil filter, so on and so forth. And yet both of those would constitute an annual inspection if you met the requirements of them. Or you can make up your own. So you can make up your own checklist. Uh, as an owner, you can create your own checklist, So, you, but it has to meet the minimum scope and detail in Appendix D. Good luck presenting this to your inspector, um, but if you provide them a checklist, has anyone ever done that? Your Nobody shop? has ever done that to me. No one's ever done that to me either. But it is something that can be done. You, you come up with your own checklist and your mechanic will look at it, or your inspector, we gotta use the right word, will look at it, make sure it meets Appendix D and then they'll look at you with a funny look and they'll say, yeah, I'll do this. And then when you leave, they'll quietly just set that aside and, and inspect what they want to look. Right. Well, I, I have gotten owner checklists before on pre-buys. Oh yeah. And, yep. and because a pre-buy is not a mandated uh, structured kind of yep. thing. It's not an inspection. It's not an inspection. Don't either. call it that. Yeah. You're, you're simply trying to assess the airframe and give the owner report back. But back to annual inspections. Oh, yeah. The other thing that we have to do Focus. as prudent to do is service all the elements of the airplane that require servicing. So we have things like batteries that may need electrolyte. We have uh, oil that should be changed, filters spark that should plugs. be spark plugs that should be cleaned, gapped and rotated, the wheel bearings, we can take the tires off and we're going to repack the wheel bearings. Mm -hmm. um, all the things that you would hope to maintain on an annual basis to keep the airplane in a safe condition. Wait a minute, wheel bearings. So let's talk about that for a second. Does it actually say that you have to remove and repack the wheel bearings? No. No, <laughs> this is bizarre. So we went through all this. It says you have to check the bearings. Mm -hmm. it says actually to inspect the landing gear and bearings. And landing brakes. gear and bearings. So does inspect include looking at them? So this is where it can get subjective. So, you know, so you can check the bearings by getting the, the brake pads out of the way and spinning the wheel, because you can hear it you can listen if it to rumbles, the yes. and you can wiggle it if it's loose, then obviously you got to do something. But you could leave that totally alone and not take the wheels off and not repack. Because you think about it, how many miles do those wheels go in a year? Not far. Not far, 100. On, how on, many do your car go? They go thousands and never get repacked. Unfortunately, depends which checklist you're working with. Uh, oh, wait, but we can make up our own. We can make up our own. If you use the minimum checklist, Appendix D, unless you've added it, you don't necessarily have to repack the wheel yep. bearings. Um, you do have to inspect them. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you use the Cirrus checklist, it says to repack the wheel that's, bearings. That's right. And so, so it can, yeah. uh, uh, the scope of an annual can be greatly influenced by which checklist you use. Yeah. Um, and, and how far you want to take it. Yeah. So I think we probably need to be real clear on the annual inspection thing. So in FAR 43, it states that you have, that the inspector 
has to use a checklist. And it says that the checklist must meet the minimum scope and detail that's in Appendix D of 43. You can use any checklist you want, uh, you being the inspector. So that's what I was trying to make the point. You can take your checklist, you as the owner operator, you go to Cirrus classes and you watch the forums and you learn all kinds of cool things and you decide, I wanna be sure that my inspector looks at this or looks at that. Or, so you can add anything to it you want and you can take things away as long as whatever you're left with at the end of the day meets the minimum in Appendix D of FAR 43. It's good clarification. The, the fact is that the uh, FAA says that we have to do an annual mm -hmm. inspection and all they mandate is a minimum level of inspection in right. that Appendix D. That Appendix D is uh, less than two pages long and it's relatively large type. It's yeah, not it's, a lot of stuff. It isn't, it's surprising. Uh, and, and, and yet if you look at the Cirrus checklist for their version of an annual inspection, it literally is 25 pages yeah. long. And the difference is the level of detail sp specific to the airframe. I would be the first to say that the uh, Appendix D is inadequate for a Cirrus. It is all this regulatorily required, but it is inadequate. There's more that we should be looking at on that airframe. Now, do we have to look at all 25 pages of items? That might be at the discretion of the owner uh, how far you want to take that. And according to the law or the regulations, it is up to the owner and the inspector. What you're trying to get the inspector to do is say, I find this airplane airworthy. It meets its type certificate and it is in a condition for safe operation. Well, one is objective one is and the subject. other one is very subjective. And I might have a different standard for what is safe for flight than Paul might. Mm -hmm. And that might have us do the same inspection on the same airplane and generate a different looking discrepancy yeah. list. Yeah, It's the, a very important point. I, I think the exception would be for owners under warranty. Uh, and. Cirrus will say you have to do the 25 hour and you have to do the 50 hour and the 100 hour, which 100 hour inspection, according to the FAA, is exactly the same thing as an annual inspection. But for purposes of warranty, it's actually a different event. And you want to actually do that 100 hour annual per Cirrus because it's a warranty issue. And it's a matter of showing to Cirrus that yes, we did all 25 pages We've, that they require. We've exercised the care and inspection that Cirrus expects to right. maintain the warranty in force. Which is way more than what the FAA requires. Considerably more. Yeah. Like like two pages versus 25 pages. <laughs> it's considerable. It's a lot. <laughs> it's way more invasive. And I'm, as you know, I'm way about eliminating, if we cannot take something apart, I, anytime we cannot take a screw or a bolt off an airplane, we have just reduced our chances of uh, having a maintenance-induced failure by a dramatic amount. So when I do a, uh, an inspection, and, and I don't have the attention span, so I don't do very many annual inspections anymore. So I, other people... We, we feel safer that Yeah, way. everybody feels safer. <laughs> uh, and I certainly don't do annual inspections on my airplane because I have a vested interest, and so mm -hmm. you got I, I get that out of it. But uh, if I can, instead of taking an entire... It's like an upholstery panel off, as an example, and put a borescope back there and look around, then maybe I take out one screw and look all, see everything I need to see and put it back on. It never says in, in the annual inspection checklist, it never says take off every panel on the airplane. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't. It just means if you can see it by some other means, then that's a great way to do it. And not take so much apart. And it's not about saving money or saving time. It's about taking less things apart. That's such an important point. The truth is that we take these airplanes apart once a year extensively. Yeah, it's take a ev lot. Every screw out, every inspection panel out, uh, and we've got to put it all back together. And every time you do that, you run the opportunity to make a small mistake in reassembly. So we've completed the annual inspection. We that was quick. <laughs> and we've taken it all apart and we've generated a discrepancy list. And right. that's what the FAA says we're supposed to call it. So we have discrepancies from what? 
Um, that is a relatively broad question. And so we get into discrepancies can be classified as an airworthiness discrepancy, something that must be dealt with, or it's a cosmetic discrepancy. And we offer it as the inspection. We found this. We'd be glad to fix it mm -hmm. for you. And that would be your choice. Yeah. So you as the owner have the opportunity to go through this discrepancy list and, and try to disposition them. I'd like this done. I'd like that done. Don't do this. What do you do when you get to something that might be called an airworthiness problem and you don't agree that it's an airworthiness yeah. problem? It's also, so, we, you know, you get into that. The first thing that an owner needs to know is that 91403 says that you're the one that's in charge of the airworthiness, not your mechanic. So it's a little different than in the Air Force the, or the military or the airlines where the mechanic makes the decisions. So we do the inspection, we report to you what's wrong. That's 91, or excuse me, FAR 4311 for an annual. But now the discrepancy list is comes on, under 43.9. And we're telling you, as you said, there's a, here are the list of airworthiness concerns. And by the way, those are only things that are airworthiness today. It's not forward looking. So it's not like, oh, this thing is gonna become an airworthiness issue in a month. It's no, it's only things that are today. And then the recommended items could be, well, like a tire that may have one landing left in it, but it's not an airworthiness item yet. So it will be after it, one landing. It will be after one landing, but it's not an airworthiness requirement at this moment. So we would put that on a recommended list, hopefully. And then you decide, because maybe you want to change the tire and you can do that tow the airplane or taxi the airplane home to your hangar and do it yourself. Well, that's such an important point. And owners need to understand that they own airworthiness of their aircraft. And they get to decide many of these things. All the inspector is doing is saying, after I've inspected it and after repairs, I find the airplane airworthy. They're just certifying that it's airworthy. Let me use an example. In an ELT, um, it, the battery is going to expire six months from today. It's airworthy today. It won't be airworthy in six months. Yeah. I'll tell you, but you're going to have to do something about that battery before the next annual. So also, we're getting a little nitpicky here. So an ELT isn't really an airworthiness item. It's a, it's a flight limitation. Exactly. So you can say, no, I don't want the ELT taken care of. Leave it like it is. Now, you can't go very far. <laughs> You know, you're going to be limited in where you can go. Or a nav light. So almost every inspector is going to write up that the uh, ELT battery, if it's past due, we're going to write up that that's an airworthiness thing when technically it really isn't. It's or, a limitation. It's a limitation. A another another example of that would be your pedostatic certification. Yeah. It, you, it's oh, yeah. not an airworthiness decision. Right. Um, so if you fly the airplane in rural Kansas all the time, you, you don't, don't really to do need to do it. Right. If you fly it in class Bravo, class Charlie, class, class Alpha, you must have it. Right. And so the inspector can actually sign off the airplane as airworthy when the pedostatic cert is not, it's it, not, not current. Yeah or nav lights not working or those sort of things. So you have to look at the list, but the, I kind of say it like this, the, the purpose of the annual inspection is for the inspector to determine airworthiness and report to the owner. And then it's the owner's job to decide to make it airworthy. In other words, it's not my decision whether or not you do these things as the inspector. You have to make that decision. And if you decide that you want items one through five done, but you don't want items six, seven, and eight, but I have classified those as airworthiness, then I don't have to do those, but I also don't get to sign it off as airworthy. I sign it off as I've completed an annual inspection and I've provided the owner with a list of discrepancies. And that, that will say, and I find the airplane on airworthy yep. and I've provided discrepancies to the owner. Mm -hmm. Now you simply have to go correct those discrepancies, Right. let's say one was a tire and it's an owner maintenance item and you decide to replace the tire. You take it over your hangar, you put the tire in. Now you don't have to make a log entry that says I've corrected this discrepancy. You make a log entry that says I've replaced the tire. Yeah, and so then, oh, but you've crossed over to the dark side, be aware. Now you've gone from part 91 guy or gal to part 43. So you have to comply with 43.9, which says if you 
uh, perform preventive maintenance or maintenance where you're doing preventive, um, you have to make a log entry. And it specifies exactly how the log entry has to be. But now you just got the airplane out of annual and hypothetically, it said, I've inspected the airplane and found it unairworthy and a list of discrepancies has been provided to the owner, which is totally legit. That's listed in 4311. You can go read it and say exactly how it, it happens. And as Roger said, you get the airplane to your hangar and you do the tire change. There's not an entry then that says the airplane is now airworthy. You make the entry that says, I installed the new tire. Which, which cleared a discrepancy. Which cleared a discrepancy. And if it's the only discrepancy, then the airplane now just magically, became airworthy. it just became airworthy. But the annual inspection, if it took you six months to change the tire because they were not available, you know, we're in the middle of COVID maybe or something like that, the next annual due date is, is from when the, the inspection occurred right from when so Roger you don't, you signed don't get a off the inspection on it. yeah even if it wasn't flying yeah and so and that brings up a good point you have an annual inspection done for some reason you're not able to fly family issues illness whatever it's going to get inspected again in a year whether you, whether it had one hour or, or not yeah doesn't matter so anyway there's a lot to an annual inspection there really is yeah. and and uh, a couple of points that are really important you as the owner own airworthiness. Absolutely. You get to decide that, not the mechanic. Not if you have mechanic. a mechanic that decides that for you, you probably need to find another mechanic. We can pick some examples uh, from uh, prior work we've done um, and, and, and war stories, but I, I like some examples. I'm aware of a fellow that called the shop and said, my engine's over TBO yeah. and I uh, want to make sure you're okay with that. The shop director of maintenance said, sure, I'm okay with that. He brought it in there and they needed to do some work to the engine and they said no you need to rebuild the engine well he was okay signing it off as airworthy as long as he didn't have to do major work to it but their shop's policy was to do no work no major engine work mm -hmm. to an engine over tbo which left him in a quandary yeah. that's uh that's that's really a fine distinction but a very important distinction that that owner would have liked to known before he sure, took that yeah. so you have to ask your questions carefully of the director of maintenance. So you're setting, you're interviewing and choosing a shop you wish to go to because you want quality work and you want the flexibility yeah. that uh, that you expect. And there's no requirement to overhaul the engine at TBO or comply with service rules. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do those things, but you should investigate. It's your decision. Uh, if the airplane- not, not the mechanics. Not the mechanics. It's always your decision. My airplane has 2,300 hours on the original engine I don't even want to think about how many hours Rogers has uh, <clears throat> or some others that have quite a few. You don't have to do that. Now, do you want to do that? That's great, but it's, it's, it's your even, choice. It's even worse than that. You and I both are flying an airplane that's over hours in TBO. And calendar. But yeah. calendar months. Right, yeah. The TBO actually says 12 years or 2,000 hours, yeah. whichever comes first. Well, my airplane's 24 years old. I 12 agree. years ago, it became out of TBO. Yeah. So... Uh, there's no requirement for a shop that says they have to overhaul anything at TBO, even a repair station, FAA repair station. If you take your airplane into a repair station, it doesn't change what's required for your airplane. Uh, the other thing that's important, back to the other one I was, example I was giving, is there's also no limitation on them on repairing that engine over TBO. Right. That was a shop decision, yeah. policy decision of that shop. If you're concerned about something, Ask somebody, we can help out. Yeah. Remember, be owner in command. Absolutely.